So good afternoon and welcome everyone to this AdNet Memory Clinics webinar. Today we'll be having a discussion of current risk reduction, early diagnostic and prevention strategies for dementia. I'm thrilled to chair this webinar with my co-host, um, also my postdoctoral fellow, so it's particularly exciting. Johannes is here today with us. Um, and we also have our wonderful presenters, Professor, Car Professor Karen Anstey and also Ralph Martins. Just before we start, I would like to do the acknowledgement of country and the Australian Dementia Network acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, their cultures and to their elders past, present and emerging. So just quickly, for those of you that are new, I hope you do know what ADNET is by now. Um, but if you don't, I'm um, just to let you know that ADNET um, it comprises three main initiatives and two support packages. So you might hear about different aspects of ADNET. One of them is the clinical quality registry, which is rolling out throughout Australia with more than 80 clinics enrolled now, which is fabulous to monitor, improve the quality of care that older Australians with MCI and dementia receive in the memory clinics privately and publicly. Um, we also have the Memory Clinics Initiative, where we're um, aiming to in improve the quality and standards of care, access to care, and to harmonise and improve diagnosis. And supporting this, we also have the Screening and Trials Initiative, where we provide detailed assessment of older individuals and access to interclinical trials, which has traditionally been um, a problem in Australia of how to access many of those clinical trials. And this is supported by AdNet Tech and AdNet Business as well. And so in this regard, if you're interested in participating in the Clinical Quality Registry, the details are here. We have a very, very friendly ADNET Clinical Quality Registry team. We have a very diverse group of stakeholders that are involved in the registry, um, as well as uh, people with lived experience of dementia and uh, their loved ones. Um, and if you're interested in participating in the ADNET Memory Clinics Network, we're also mapping clinics around Australia. So we've now mapped over 150 services around Australia. We include very detailed information about the clinic, including the types of services and languages spoken, et cetera. And we like to think this is a very useful resource, not only for ourselves, but also for GPs um, and other health professionals, and also people who are seeking an assessment um, for a cognitive disorder. Um, also, just to let you know, the neuropsychologist there, I hope many of you are with us today. We have a new neuropsychology norming tool. The aim is really to try to streamline your time so you can see more patients or provide cognitive interventions. Um, and one of the ways we're hoping to start this is really by assisting with providing more automated norming um, for you. So this is free. All you need to do is complete the registration form and you can get access to the tool to use in your clinical practice. And of course, um, we're always looking for feedback on any of the initiatives that we're doing. So feel free to provide that as well. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our wonderful speakers. Um, so Professor Karen Anstey and Professor Ralph Martins, I'm sure they're both known to um, all of you here, certainly national treasures in the dementia field. Um, to, so to start with, uh, Professor Anstey is an ARC Laureate Fellow in the School of Psychology at the University of New South Wales and a Conjoint Senior Principal Research Scientist at Neuroscience Research Australia. So Karen's research programs focus on the causes, consequences and prevention of cognitive ageing and dementia. And she's developed many validated risk assessment tools and is an investigator on several multi-domain risk reduction trials. She was a member of the WHO guideline development um, committee and the guidelines for risk reduction for cognitive decline and dementia, which um, you'll know are used throughout the world now. So we might have Karen present to us first, and then after Karen's presentation, um, we'll follow with Professor Martins, and then we'll have the questions and answers at the end. Uh, so thank you very much. Over to you, Karen. Thank you very much for um, the opportunity to speak to you today. I'd just like to acknowledge the medical people here who are the custodians here at UNSW. I'm talking to you about evidence-based risk assessment to inform risk reduction advice. Um, so we'll talk quickly about the evidence for modifiable risk factors, practical considerations for assessing risk and giving advice, and then I'll describe some available risk tools. It's a fairly uh, quick talk, so if you want any further information, please don't hesitate to contact me. 
So just a quick summary of their evidence. Um, on the left of this slide, you can see the very well-known figure from the Lancet Commission report on dementia. Um, and this really depicts what was the state of knowledge according to the Lancet Commission in 2020. Now the field has already moved on, um, but this contains some valuable information. And I think one of the key points here is it shows that there's a life course trajectory for risk factors for dementia. So the most important risk factor is actually low education and it counts the most population attributable risk globally. Um, and then we have a cluster of midlife risk factors, which are mostly vascular. So um, they included hypertension and obesity, but the WHO guidelines also includes um, high cholesterol, as well as traumatic brain injury and hearing loss and um, heavy drinking. And then there's another cluster of risk factors that are important in late life, smoking, depression, social isolation, physical inactivity, air pollution, and diabetes. Now, this is uh, was really important data synthesis, but um, it's obviously limited by the available data at the time. And most of the studies that the evidence comes from are actually started in old age. So sometimes when a risk factor is only included in late life, it's because we simply don't have evidence on that risk factor from midlife into late life. For example, loneliness. We don't know if lifelong loneliness from middle age increases the risk of dementia. We've only got data on, on old age. Now, if you look at the other literature, the other um, things like the WHO guidelines and other big systematic reviews and umbrella reviews, some of the key risk factors that they also include for which there's really strong evidence now are midlife high cholesterol diet. So diet, a healthy diet, um, or an unhealthy diet was included as a risk factor in the WHO guidelines and they make recommendations about the healthy diet and the Mediterranean diet. Chronic kidney disease is recognized as a risk factor for dementia by um, the number of systematic reviews in the AIHW here in Australia. Atrial fibrillation now has quite a lot of evidence um, showing it's a risk factor, insomnia and stroke. So if we just focus now on Australia, so the WHO guidelines and the Lancet Commission, that was sort of global um, overarching pieces of work that synthesise information across all countries. It's really important that we understand the picture here in Australia and what we're dealing with in terms of dementia risk. So some time ago now, we estimated the population attributable risk for the key risk factors for dementia. And what we found was that the two most important risk factors that we're facing here are midlife obesity and insufficient physical activity. So they account for the most population attributable risk of dementia in Australia, followed by midlife hypertension and depression. So I think it's, it's just important to get a sense of what, what are, should be our priorities from a public health perspective. So I'm just going to talk about diet and physical activity a little bit because they are modifiable, they are risk factors for multiple chronic diseases of ageing. Um, and it's good to know the evidence on them. And I think this slide here summarises the most useful information about physical activity. And that is that um, if you look at studies that have compared people who adhere to the national guidelines of physical activity versus people who don't meet those guidelines, um, the systematic review showed that adhering to the national guidelines was associated with a reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease of 40% over the next five years, which is a really simple, clear message that um, we need to stick to guidelines. And nearly all countries have similar guidelines for physical activity, which are based on WHO guidelines, which are the 150 minutes a week of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Now, there's been an awful lot of much more um, in-depth research on the type of physical activity and um, trials. There's been animal models. Uh, there's all sorts of, sorts of research. So it can get very complicated. But this is the key message. Um, and the other thing to note about physical activity is it's moderate to vigorous physical activity that is important for cognition. So when we're looking at ageing and frailty, any physical activity is important and beneficial for older people. But when we're looking at cognition, the systematic reviews show that the physical activity needs to be moderate to vigorous. I'm just going to talk about diet. So as I said, Lancet Commission didn't include diet, and it's probably because diet is very complex. You've got dietary patterns, you've got specific foods, and you've got nutrients. And so when we did an umbrella review of the literature, we actually found there's more published on diet and dementia and diet and cognitive decline than any other area. Um, and it's just that it's difficult to synthesize and get a clear message about diet. So what the, the field is really looking now at dietary patterns. They're much, that, that's how you know, 
translatable, it's how people live, is according to their, their dietary habits and their dietary patterns. So meta-analyses have shown that um, adhering to the Mediterranean style diet reduces the risk of Alzheimer's disease, but not dementia more broadly. So it's not impacting on vascular dementia primarily. When you look at all cause dementia in these data sets, is usually mostly is Alzheimer's disease. And so the, the second biggest um, cause would be vascular dementia. The DASH um, diet has also been shown to be protective. But if you actually look at the broad literature, but virtually any healthy diet when compared to a very poor diet, you know, the healthy diet has better health outcomes. So any diet that's that's got fruit and vegetables and a low um, portion of processed and junk food is going to be healthier. You have much better health outcomes um, across major areas of chronic disease, including cognitive decline and risk of dementia. But we really focus now on the MIND diet, which is a specific type of Mediterranean diet for which the evidence is now the strongest. So the MIND diet was developed to focus as a scoring method where they score your dietary pattern according to this um, algorithm, which emphasizes the neuroprotective foods. And those foods are green leafy vegetables, berries, fish, and nuts. And then it, you also, uh, it scores according to how many unhealthy foods you eat. I've got the scoring here on the slide for anyone who's interested. Now, this was developed in the United States by Martha Morris, and it was shown to reduce the risk of um, Alzheimer's disease in cohort studies. And then in those studies that follow people to autopsy, people who adhered to this diet also had less Alzheimer's pathology. Um, so the issue with diet, though, is it's very dependent on where you conduct the study. So if you, because different countries have different food availability, different climate, uh, so really, in every one of these studies is the comparison diet that's important. So we needed to look at it in Australia. And what we, we did, we looked at this in the past through life cohort. It's a longitudinal study of Australian adults who are initially aged 60 to 64. And over 12 years, they used a CSIRO food frequency questionnaire. So designed for Australians asking about the sorts of foods that we eat. We found people who adhered to the, to the MIND diet um, had a significantly reduced risk of um, converting to cognitive impairment or dementia during that time, but the Mediterranean dietary pattern uh, was not protective. So I think a number of us now in our randomised controlled trials where we're looking at multi-domain interventions, we're recommending that people adhere to the MIND diet. So I'm now going to talk about practical considerations for assessing risk and risk reduction. Um, so we know a lot about the risk factors, um, but we need to develop methods to assess risk. Um, so what we, my team has spent a lot of time developing risk tools and evaluating those risk tools. And through that process and working with other teams internationally, we, we've learned quite a lot. Um, the risk tool needs to be accessible and usable. So often you'll see a risk tool mentioned in the literature, but it's actually not available in a usable form. So there's really only been... Um, three or four tools that have actually got to the point where you can go online, you can use the tool. But importantly, the tool needs to be validated. So you can't just have a tool that you develop on your study and be sure that it's going to work in a different population. So we need to check that the tools have been validated externally on data sets from other countries or other, other populations. Um, and so we've always validated all our tools and the good tools, you'll find that validation information. Um, another important factor about risk assessment tools, which sometimes gets overlooked because it's almost so obvious, and that's that you need to have the information about the threshold at which risk occurs, because many of the risk factors we're talking about are on a continuum. So it's like how much um, social engagement is protective, how much physical activity or how little physical activity is putting somebody at risk of dementia. So that the tool has to have that threshold built in and it has to be based on evidence, a threshold that's been linked to dementia. Um, and so it, it's clear cut when you've got a binary outcome. Does the person have diabetes? Do they smoke? Okay, that's all clear. It's a lot of the, the other risk factors for dementia are the small psychosocial things that are actually quite difficult to measure and need to be done using validated instruments. So in our tools, we include validated measures of depression, Centre of Epidemiological um, Studies depression scale, and then we've done a systematic review to look at the actual thresholds on, on that scale, the score that is linked to an increased risk of depression, of dementia. Um, ideally, the risk tool will be linked to useful information then for the person completing the, the tool or the clinician. 
and linked back to guidelines about what an appropriate um, response should be. So whether it's, it's alcohol consumption linked to national guidelines on safe drinking, for example. Um, and in, if, if a risk score has been used in clinical practice, um, the, the advice has to be tailored clearly to the individual. So their particular uh, comorbidities, their age and their lifestyle and what's acceptable to them, what areas they would feel most comfortable changing in their life. So I just want to, um, when you're looking at risk, particularly in a clinical context, in a memory clinic, um, it's, it's helpful just to be aware of the distinction between the risk factors and the risk indicators, because you'll be looking at both of these when you see people in a memory clinic. Um, the risk factors are completely independent of the outcome. So, you know, smoking increases the risk of lung cancer, smoking also increases the risk of dementia. So that's a risk factor. And they're usually the lifestyle uh, factors that we intervene on. So, you know, loneliness and physical, insufficient physical activity. Um, they, and also some of the medical risk factors are hypertent, midlife hypertension, midlife high cholesterol um, and diabetes. The risk indicators um, may appear as risk factors, but they're actually related to the disease process, the underlying disease process. So it may be a blood biomarker. It may be... Um, white matter hyperintensities on an MRI scan, or even uh, mild memory loss. So they're not, these are people who, who are preclinical, they may have MCI, and those are risk indicators that these people are at increased risk of dementia. So we usually focus, we're focusing much more on the risk factors in terms of intervention. So how are risk scores used? I think possibly um, sometimes people aren't aware of just how widely used uh, these instruments are. So uh, we're, we're using them across um, public health quite a lot, policy, clinical research. So risk tools are used um, to do population modelling. So we've done, for example, we've done, we've published on the economics of risk reduction for Australia and estimated how much money the government would save through interventions by preventing cases of dementia. So we've been able to do that with our risk tools we can evaluate um, population level hotspots where there's a lot of risk factors for uh, dementia, in particular geographical re regions. Um, we've been able to, in the clinic, um, risk tools are obviously used to inform uh, patients um, of, their, of their risk. And uh, we can also target high risk groups um, in, in the clinic. In research, uh, risk tools are used to select people into clinical trials and to evaluate programs. And also um, they're used as surrogate outcomes, particularly in a trial, say midlife adults, where we're not gonna be able to follow people long enough for dementia, but we wanna see if our lifestyle intervention is working. We can use a, a, a risk tool as an outcome. Just gonna describe the available risk tools. Um, so one, this first one is one that my team developed in 2013 called the ANU um, ADRI. It was developed from the systematic reviews of the literature on what was available at that time and included quite a big range of risk factors. Um, it, was public, it was developed so it could be completed by self-report, so it can be used in low resource settings. And it has actually been up, uh, taken up. It's been translated into different languages. It's recommended by the European um, Task Force for the Brain Health Clinics. Um, it's by the AHW, the GP Red Book, and, and quite a lot of um, places are using this tool. But it was developed in 2013, so it's uh, based on older literature. Um, the other tool is the CAVE that was developed in 2006 by Mia Kivapelto's group in Finland. So again, quite an old tool, but is widely used. It was used to select participants for the finger trial, for example. It's a midlife risk tool focusing on vascular risk factors. Another uh, tool that's available is the Libra tool, um, and that was developed in the Netherlands on one particular cohort study. Um, so the, the tool that we developed was based on all of the literature using systematic reviews and then the CAID, and this tool were developed from a single cohort. So all of these tools are based on fairly old literature. We felt there was a need to update and we produced the COGDI risk, which is now published and we've, uh, our, public, our validation study is now also um, in press, it's about to appear. So this was developed, it was basically similar to the ANU ADRI, but basically updates the literature uh, using all the, the new literature. So now it includes sleep, it includes stroke, and it includes atrial fibrillation. Uh, it's validated on four international data sets and um, 
a short form is in development and also versions in other languages. So that's there. Um, and just to give you a sense of the relative um, effects of the different risk factors, we uh, put this together on the cognitive risk. So it shows you, as I mentioned earlier, education actually has the biggest risk um, for dementia, low education. Um, and then other bigger risk factors are depression, it's quite significant, um, as well as uh, the vascular risk factors. And then surprisingly, compared to the other uh, risk factors, insufficient physical activity it has a smaller effect size. It, it, the issue is it's so prevalent, that's why it has a bigger population attributable risk in Australia. Um, so the population attributable risk includes the prevalence and the effect size. Um, so this is, just gives you a comparison across all of the risks. And then we also looked at the different risk tools that are out there now. So in this table, I've just we just listed um, the different risk factors that are included in the different risk assessment tools. And basically the more recent tools, so cognitive risk is the most recent tool. It includes the most risk factors because the evidence base is growing all the time. Um, and there is a, um, what we find a cumulative risk of dementia, but it does top out at a certain number of risk factors. So um, you know, we're looking at um, how many risk factors you need to optimise uh, risk assessment at the moment. So just to summarise, um, risk assessment is a key component of dementia prevention. It's used in, the tools are used in policy, public health and in clinics. Um, they do meet a need in the wider community. So a lot of people from the public like to be able to go online and use an evidence-based risk assessment tool. I get asked a lot when I give public talks about this. Um, the tools that we have now um, are well validated, they're reliable and they are in use. If you'd like any more information about risk factors for dementia, I'm very happy to um, correspond with you, put my um, uh, email address there because this is such a, a short talk. So, and more information is also on our website, including um, fact sheets in um, many uh, community languages about the dementia risk factors. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, every time I listen to you speak, I always hear something new. Um, so we actually have 150 people um, online. So I'm sure we are gonna have lots of questions for you, um, but we might move on to Ralph's talk first and then come back. So please all save up your questions, put them in the Q&A. Um, and of course you can promote each other's questions if there are a few in common. Um, so it's now my great pleasure to introduce Ralph Martins. Ralph holds a joint academic appointment as professor of neurobiology at Macquarie University in Sydney and the Foundation Professor of Ageing and Alzheimer's Disease at Edith Cowan University in Perth. He's the Director of the Centre of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease Research and Care and Founder and Director of Research at the Australian Alzheimer's Research Foundation. He's also the head of the Western Australian site of the Diane study funded by the US NIH um, for a global longitudinal study of people with genetically inherited Alzheimer's disease. And he's the Australia Day ambassador since 2011 and a Rotarian Action Group board member. He's also a board member of the International Federation of Aging, which is influential and prominent non-government organization, which works closely with the United Nations and also with the World Health Organization. And we're very excited today, and we do hope that Ralph's gonna tell us about his latest study, um, the AU Arrow study. I'm pretty sure he is, so um, welcome, Ralph. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll be talking to you a bit about our work on uh, early preclinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And towards the end of my talk, I'll talk a bit about our, our prevention intervention uh, uh, clinical trial. Uh, most of it has been covered by Karen so beautifully, uh, but it'll, it'll give you a feel for what we're trying to do. Uh, you know, Alzheimer's disease uh, has now been uh, uh, described you know, over a hundred years ago by Dr. Alois Alzheimer. His first patient was Augusta D. And he described the clinical symptoms. Uh, uh, there were many paranoia and memory loss uh, in this lady. Uh, she was 51 years of age when she was diagnosed. And today we know it's uh, actually, a, she's got a familial form of Alzheimer's disease. She's got a mutation in Prisman 1. But uh, uh, Alzheimer's described uh, the neuropathology of Alzheimer's disease in, in this particular patient. And as you can see, uh, tangles, congenital amyloid angiopathy, and amyloid plaques were, were the major features. 
And in the mid 80s, Colin Masters uh, played a major role in isolating these amyloid plaques. I was fortunate to be a member of his team. And we demonstrated the major protein uh, present in these plaques was beta amyloid. And there are just two forms, so 1 to 40, and the more sticky and toxic form, A beta 1 to 42. Now, this cartoon here just illustrates that high level of amyloid uh, results in Alzheimer's disease. And this increased level of beta amyloid can, be, uh, can result from many different uh, ways. In particular, if one has mutations such as Augusta D's mutation, the precinal one, uh, there's a market increased production of beta amyloid. And it happens so aggressively that the onset is very early, as, as early as the 30s in some cases, even though it's a relatively uh, rare form of Alzheimer's. Uh, in late onset Alzheimer's disease, one of the major genetic risk factors is ApoE4. And, and it's a risk factor, not a causative gene, but definitely if one has um, uh, carried single E4, your risk is doubled. And if you have two copies, um, most people do get the disease. And it accounts for 50% of all Alzheimer cases. Uh, so it's, it is the major risk factor. We know it's, it's a risk factor, but we still don't understand why and how it causes risk. Then there are hormones that play a role. Uh, and in particular, estrogen and testosterone in menopause and in andropause, both these hormones regulate the production of beta amyloid. So in menopause and andropause, these hormones uh, fall uh, quite significantly and beta amyloid levels rise. And finally, the neglected area has been lifestyle uh, that is now clearly showing to play a major role. And, and, and Karen alluded to it in, in our presentation uh, uh, in terms of an increasing beta amyloid. So about uh, 16 years, uh, 16 to 17 years ago, uh, a group of us got together, uh, my team in Perth, Western Australia, and Colin Masters and, and Chris Rowe in, in Melbourne, and the CSRO to establish what we call the Australian Imaging Biomarker and Lifestyle Study of Aging. Uh, and, and this was uh, initially 1,100 participants across the spectrum from healthy controls of people with Alzheimer's disease. And uh, since then, we've, we've recruited over 2,000 people. And it's a longitudinal study where we follow people every 18 months. And there are a, a number of pillars, uh, cognition, blood biomarkers, genomics, demographic, and lifestyle. Uh, and we uh, had two primary questions. One is, can we diagnose Alzheimer's early, you know, as opposed to the neuropathological diagnosis uh, uh, during life? And uh, we also want to know, does lifestyle matter? So, so that was our, our major brief. And one of our major findings in, in the early days, and this was a work led by Chris Rowe and, and Victor Willemania, uh, where we looked at uh, people with Alzheimer's disease and 98% had their brain full of amyloid as opposed to MCI, where two thirds had, a, uh, had a amyloid positivity. And what was very intriguing to us at the time, uh, you know, about a third of the people who are healthy controls were amyloid positive. So, so this was a major breakthrough uh, through Australia, but also in the United States uh, that showed that amyloid imaging can be a, a very good way of diagnosing Alzheimer's early. And what our teams went on to show that uh, while someone is amyloid positive, it, can, it takes a good 20 years before uh, 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 people can uh, actually show symptoms of dementia and it allows a, a window for intervention. And this is now basically uh, what's been used now by clinical trial uh, uh, groups to, to basically identify high-risk individuals with Alzheimer's disease. So this was a game changer, but the problem is that uh, both uh, imaging uh, the brain uh, is rather expensive uh, and CSF, which is also another very accurate way of, of diagnosing Alzheimer's disease is rather invasive. So neither of these would have uh, wider accessibility to the community. And so what my team have been focusing on is developing a diagnostic blood test for preclinical Alzheimer's disease. And I've been working in this area for the last 25 years. And we've, you know, we came close, but not close enough until recently. And what's made, made the major change to uh, uh, our, our program in early diagnosis is having technology. Uh, in this case, it was a Samoa, which allows us to measure proteins and brain proteins in the blood a thousand times more sensitively and much more accurately than previously before. Uh, we uh, uh, 
uh, were targeting uh, proteins that were linked to the neurogeneration of Alzheimer's disease, and obviously we were interested in beta amyloid 40 and 42, uh, NFL, which is linked to neurodegeneration, astrocytes for inflammation, and uh, the, the tau uh, forms uh, initially total tau, phosphor tau 181 and 231. So this was our major targets in our initial study. And we first uh, undertook a study in healthy controls. Uh, this is the Cavia court uh, from a retirement village where uh, 67 individuals were, were amyloid negative, cognitively normal, and 33 were amyloid positive. This is just basically the demographics, but the only major difference is the APOE4 is enriched in the AB positive group. So what we clearly showed was that the GFAP levels are significantly elevated in people who are amyloid positive, cognitively normal people. And if we take into account uh, the base model, age, sex, and APOE genotype, we get an accuracy of 96%. And this was uh, basically demonstrated in another court in, in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, which basically confirmed what we found. Uh, and then when we extended this work to people at 12 months, based on 12 months, uh, we showed that GFE levels actually increase in this relatively short period of time. And the other markers, phosphor tau 181 and phosphor tau 231, were also elevated in the amyloid positive group. Uh, uh, and in early onset Alzheimer's disease and in late onset Alzheimer's disease, GFEP levels are, are, are even more elevated. And what we find also that this increase in GFAP is relatively specific for Alzheimer's disease as compared to the other degenerative neurodegenerative diseases. We then went on to the, uh, uh, the ABLE cohort, our highly characterized ABLE cohort, where we had uh, individuals across the spectrum. We also had longitudinal samples, but initially we, we, uh, and we investigated in, in this cohort. And as you can see here, uh, uh, on your left, when we look at phosphor tau 181, you see it's, it's significantly elevated uh, in, in the cognitively unimpaired amyloid positive group. Uh, likewise, in the MCI group, uh, positive group, uh, and mostly all Alzheimer's cases were elevated. If you look on the right uh, side, when we look at uh, over three time points, 18 month time points, we, we, you can see that uh, uh, in Alzheimer's disease, the levels are just markedly elevated. Uh, and they tend to plateau then. Likewise, with GFAP, we see the similar pattern. Uh, but with GFAP, we see it continuing to rise, both in MCI and AD. So this could be a marker of, of progression of disease. And this is why we think GFP is much more attractive compared to our other candidates. Uh, and in NFL, we don't see changes in cognitively impaired people, which is understandable because neurodegeneration hasn't kicked in until you get into the clinical phase of the disease. Finally, we looked at Diane, and Sharon mentioned the Dompton Inherited Alzheimer Network. So this was a partnership across uh, 20 labs around the world. Three of them were from Australia, uh, and where we compared mutation carriers versus non-carriers in this group, where the, uh, there were a number of mutations uh, that cause Alzheimer's disease. What's very exciting about this work is that we know the estimated year of onset based on the parent's year of onset. So it's within a couple of years different. So it gives us great accuracy in predicting uh, uh, basically uh, uh, the preclinical phase where, when the disease, the biomarkers come on. And as you can see, the phosphor tau 181 is 20 years before the onset of symptoms and likewise with GFAP, whereas NFL is, is significantly later. Uh, and I just uh, skipped this slide, it's rather busy, but just to show that in, in this cohort, both phosphor tau 181 and, and GFAP are showing the highest levels of accuracy for, or across the spectrum. And when we compare it against brain amyloid load for tau 181, GFAP and NFL, you can see that there's this positive correlation. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a negative correlation with hippocampal volume and the same thing with the, with the cognitive composite scores. So it's, it clearly reflects changes in, in brain pathology. So in summary, uh, and I have not mentioned uh, about aduhelm or lecanemab, but these are the two drugs that now have got FDA approval uh, uh, that definitely show a marked cleanup of the amyloid load uh, within a period of just 12 months. But lecanemab is now looking very exciting and we think it'll be coming to Australia relatively shortly. Uh, what I try to show is that the PET amyloid imaging demonstrates cerebral amyloid buildup decades before the onset of symptoms. 
And blood biomarkers are now becoming very exciting, reflecting changes in the brain, in particular phosphatau 181, 231, and GFAP, but there are more that are coming out. Uh, uh, we find that in combination with, with other factors, uh, with the base model, GFP is, is the front runner, but time will tell uh, this will hold. What does the future hold? We, we, we plan to take this to memory clinics and Sharon Naismith, who's, who's our chair, is playing a, a leading role in this, in the memory clinics for ADNET. Uh, but uh, my team are now focusing on developing our own antibodies uh, that will help bring down the cost of, of this uh, of a diagnostic test. Uh, and we are targeting uh, the ones that I mentioned, but also some very novel ones, such as phosphor tau 205, which is associated with a protective effect in Alzheimer's disease. And just to give you a snapshot view, we, we're still not funded uh, adequately. We just had some pilot studies, but we've now succeeded in getting a very good antibody to actually clones for phosphor tau 205. Uh, I'm not sure how much my time is going, but I'll just briefly talk about the Oz Arrow Yeah, trial. you're good, Ralph. I'm good. Thanks. Good Thanks for time. Thank you. Uh, and really, uh, uh, some background. Uh, you know, uh, our teams have shown, and, and this is in the ABLE study. It's it's uh, observational uh, that uh, regular exercise, both aerobic and resistance, shows improvement in cognitive function. And likewise, with the Mediterranean diet, we we see this protective effect. Uh, and very interestingly, uh, the ABLE study is very kind of exclusively for Alzheimer's. So it's been screened that way. Uh, and it clearly showed that people who adhere to the Mediterranean diet uh, have a reduction or low levels of amyloid in their brain. Uh, we've also shown that brain training, computerized brain training, uh, has, a, has a positive effect on cognitive function uh, and vascular and type 2 diabetes. But these were all done in isolation. Uh, we, and as, as mentioned by Karen, uh, the diet seemed to be having the most profound effect. Uh, and, and the Medi diet, as I mentioned, we clearly show a, a great benefit uh, in, in if you adhere to it strongly and you don't smoke, that there's a reduction in amyloid load in the brain. Uh, and and also this was mentioned by by, by Karen about the, the DASH diet, uh, which is basically targeting, uh, designed to reduce blood pressure uh, and, uh, and provides benefit to people who uh, are trying to control uh, cholesterol and prevent diabetes and cognitive decline. So it's basically a diet characterized by low consumption of saturated fat, total fat, red and processed meat, sugar and salt, and a proportion of, of, of fruits and vegetables in particular, keeping dairy low. Uh, and so uh, we uh, in Ozara, we'll be using the MIND diet, which is taking the best of both the Mediterranean diet and the, uh, the DASH diet. Uh, now, what are the mechanisms of the mind diet? We, we still don't quite fully understand them, but we, what we clearly know that it decreases uh, vascular risk factors, such as your, your blood lipid profiles, your, lowers your blood pressure, less insulin resistance and weight loss, and less inflammation and less oxidative, oxidative stress. And interestingly, it, it can target the, the toxic proteins, particularly the, the metabolism of amyloid. Uh, selective nutrients have a very powerful effect on, on uh, the amyloid metabolism, uh, reducing beta amyloid load. Uh, so uh, our combination study, uh, which is also Arrow, uh, basically uh, was a result of the wonderful work undertaken by Mia Kiwipelto in Finland, uh, where she clearly showed that adhering to this uh, this multimodal approach uh, had, had a significant effect on lowering cognitive decline in older people. Uh, and so the question is, can we see a similar effect in Australia? Uh, we are undertaking this at two sites. Uh, so we have the multi-domain uh, lifestyle of a group uh, and we have people are just given advice. Uh, uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, we have been trying to align it very closely with the US pointer study. They've got 2000 people in the study as opposed to our 600 with the aim of, of really bringing together the data from, from, from both countries. Uh, it's the multi-domain lifestyle group is very intense and you can see there's 77 interactions uh, with this group where there are, uh, we have uh, exercise physiologists, dietitians, uh, they have access to gyms and they'll be monitored. 
so it's quite an intensive program, but this work is now currently, uh, recruitment is currently started. Uh, we welcome people from Perth and Adelaide, uh, Perth, sorry, and Sydney who would like to participate. So if any of you would like to do it, I know people who would want to please uh, get in touch with me or to through Adnet. Uh, one of our, our outcomes are, are rather ambitious. We have a, a number of outcomes, much more than any of the other uh, finger trial groups. And in particular, uh, we have a, 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 a strong uh, look at sleep and its monitoring. And uh, Sharon is playing a major role basically in leading this aspect of our program. But we also unique in that, as I mentioned about the blood mark research, we will be investigating that in, in this cohort. Uh, looking at its effects, both in, in terms of early diagnosis of people, but also response to treatment, as well as the eye biomarker research. And these are just some of the aims that we're focusing on, the unique aims that Oz Arrow will be bringing uh, to, to, to the finger Worldwide Fingers program, uh, as well as this other aims that are done by other groups as well. So we, we believe that it'll improve the quality of life of the elderly, maintenance of good cognitive health, uh, and uh, the, the aims of OZARO's combined intervention are to preserve and improve cognitive health and to encourage long-term maintenance of such a lifestyle. Uh, a financial evaluation has been done for fingers in, in Finland and shown to be uh, really viable. And, but, um, and we believe that when we look at the other factors that improve such as cardio, cardiac health and other chronic conditions, it, it will definitely be a, a very wonderful way to to, to reduce our risk of, of dementia, but also make it so cost effective. Uh, we are looking at other programs that will be synergistic to Oz Arrow. Uh, a, a number of, of reviews will be underway. And we're working with the Maggie Beer Foundation uh, to really de develop uh, uh, Australian dietary guidelines for the older adults that does not exist today. Uh, just need to acknowledge all our team members. Uh, Professor Karen Anstey, as well as Sharon, uh, Sharon Nason, who I mentioned earlier, who has played a key role in helping us design it. Without her help, I think we would not have had some, such a wonderful protocol in place uh, and many other of our team members. Uh, uh, and if anyone wants to uh, join our studies or Zaro, uh, uh, as well as the AdNet network, uh, please feel free to contact us, contact me. Uh, and with that, I think I'll end, acknowledge all our team members. As you can see, it's a huge team present in our Combat 80 team in, in Perth and Sydney. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ralph. Um, what an amazing body of work. You really have been a trailblazer in our field. Um, so Thank congratulations you. for all of that work and the work on the biomarkers, the lifestyle interventions, so much that you and your team are doing. And I know that takes great personal sacrifice flying across from Sydney to Perth all the time. So I would like to welcome back uh, Karen to our stage. Um, and hand over to my lovely co-chair, uh, Johannes, uh, to take the questions and answers. Thank you so much, Sharon. And, and thank you again, Karen and, and Ralph, for your talks. We, we do have a few questions, which is great. But uh, another shout out to the audience that there's still time. If you have questions, please do submit them by the Q&A. Uh, Karen, probably the first question for you, um, and I can see someone in the audience has uh, my train of thought. When you showed the table comparing um, the different risk tools, particularly the COGD risk, and I think it was the CADE, as well as, oh, sorry, the ANU ADRI, um, alcohol um, didn't seem to translate over to the COGD risk. And I thought, you know, given we're a yeah. society that loves good drop, um, why, why was that the case? Is there a reasoning behind that? Yeah, so alcohol is, is a complex one. Um, so all of the systematic review uh, literature on alcohol actually shows that light to moderate drinking is associated with reduced risk of dementia. Um, and it's, so it's put us into quite a quandary. Um, so there's not evidence in the systematic review literature. So that, And then the Lancet Commission showed that um, heavy drinking in midlife, they say, increased the risk of dementia. The WHO is getting more and more conservative and now thinks that no level of alcohol consumption is safe across when you look at all health outcomes like cancer as well. Mm -hmm. So what we have ended up doing, so this has been, we've discussed this in depth in the team. What we've ended up doing is we assess alcohol consumption in our questionnaire and then we use the NHMRC guidelines mm -hmm. um, to, for advice. So um, because we can't say to people, well, actually, the evidence shows that it, it, you know, people who drink have a reduced risk because it's much more complicated than that. And so we need a simple message. 
Um, so that, yeah, that's how we're handling it in quality risk. So it's not included as, an, as a risk or a protective factor in any of the scoring, um, but we assess it and give advice on safe drinking. Yeah, right. And, and in terms of um, the drinks that we're talking about, the you know the light, light to moderate consumption, it's, it's usually the red wines, I'm guessing, are the wines, not like the spirits that are considered to be somewhat protective it's unclear which type of alcohol I mean, okay. um, is protective. In, in some studies show that it's any, it's just alcohol per se. Others have shown it's red wine, um, you know, and linked it to specific um, anthocyanins in, you know, red foods. So, but it's really unclear. There's no, you couldn't say at this point, there's a consensus on that. Sure. Uh, another question for you, Karin, uh, it's a question from Alice in the audience. Uh, would the COG-D risk tool be appropriate for people, uh, for use by lay people and, and in terms of, ease of use of language and then also I guess question for me is is a report provided at the end of that um I'm yeah. sure many people are, are very interested in the tool yeah yeah so it is um it it's freely accessible online and it does produce a pdf report um I know that some GPs are using it uh, they ask their patients to do it and then they can discuss the report with them and we're working um on trying to get some other formats that are, are accessible and usable uh, but it, at the moment, you could go online and use it as it is. Yeah, and we're also developing a short form because it is quite long to to assess everything comprehensively. So we're developing a short form as well. Fantastic, and I, I think I've I've popped the link in the chat for anyone that's interested in our audience. Um, a bit of love for Ralph now in terms of questions, and there's a few of them. Um, I do have a qu few questions myself, but I might I might um, be kind and and, and go to the Q and A. Uh, I think there was one question here, and it's been uh, where is it? Uh, here it is. Oh, well, it's a very simple question. When do you think the community will have access uh, to these uh, blood-based biomarkers? That's probably a question that we all have in our minds, given the evidence behind it and, and how important they seem to be. Wait, how far do you, off do you think we are? What, what, what else needs to be done before we implement them? Yeah, so, so that's a very good question. And, and uh, I, uh, you know, we always say it takes a, in a few years time it'll happen, but I'm very confident it'll take within five years, provided we get sufficient funding to take us to this next stage, you know, uh, uh, it'll be out there in the community. And, and as I mentioned earlier, Professor Sharon A. Smith is already bring it into the clinic, into the memory clinics as a starting point, probably as early as, as later this year. Uh, so I'm, I'm very confident that it'll, it'll happen. Uh, I'm very keen to make it happen in Australia. Uh, so, you know, we, we were going to these blood tests because they're easily accessible, you know, like taking a cholesterol test, but uh, some, the costs are, are still pretty high. I mean, there, there's one company in the United States that's that's got FDA approval for beta amyloid in blood, and that's costing over $1,000 a, a test, you know. And and the companies that market the uh, the kits for 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 the the, the biomarkers I showed you they're just going sky high, and so that's why I'm committed to getting uh, our own antibodies that'll be Australian owned and we'll have kits that'll bring down the price down to ten percent. So we really need funding to take that forward, but like I said, I'm very confident within the next five years it'll be available in the community. Brilliant, and in in I guess. What do you see? What what do you do? You think that it will be a silver bullet that one biomarker will be the be the answer, or do you see it's a panel? For example, NFL no. level yes. indication. Yes. So so I don't think it's going to be a, a, a single marker. I mean, GFAP is looking really exciting, but I'd see uh, would see at least three markers, three to four markers together will take us across the line. They're really, uh, and we already got those markers looking good. Uh, now, so yes, uh, but we we need to now test them as those panels, and th and that would be part of our, our role. Once we've got our own antibodies, set up our own uh, what we call a homebrew assays, then we will look at these panels. And this is what this uh, technology allows us to do: to look at a panel of markers together that will take us across the line. I also saw some uh, some very uh, very interesting questions. Can I address some of them that come up on the screen? Uh, yeah, someone asked me, uh, "Do you think the healthy controls of plaques would always go on to develop?" Alzheimer's by approximately 20 years mark is still alive? I think that's an excellent question. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, uh, when we, and what we've been doing in ABLE is we've been following people now for a good 16 years. And people have different rates of trajectories. Their trajectories are different. So some people will get there within the eight year period that we followed, so much quicker, and others are much, much longer. And again, this points to uh, environmental factors. So I, I think if people can intervene with uh, lifestyle approaches, uh, uh, 
I think that that would then markedly reduce that rate of accumulation. I'm very confident of that. So, uh, so not necessarily uh, everyone would get there. Yeah, um, I, I I do see the questions are flooding in. So, and Karen and, and Ralph, if if there are any questions that you think that um, you can answer, feel free to type them as well, so we don't. Um, yeah. Um, without an answer. Yeah. Uh, there was one question, just a simple one, I think for you, Ralph, it was, will the AU Arrow study be available in the Sydney Eastern suburbs? Um, yes, I saw that and the answer is yes. yes. But there's also a quick question. When you say signs of dementia are like to appear 20 years after amylopia, is there evidence for more subtle cognitive changes? We really need some really smart and dedicated neuropsychologists to help us because we haven't got that level of sensitivity yet. But that, that's a question that really needs to be addressed. So the current answer is no, unfortunately. And there is a question about metformin. I see, Karen, you're answering that, but feel free. I'm to... trying to answer it. Sorry. Um, I was just going to say that there's clinical trials are underway looking at metformin. That, so the, hopefully the results will be out soon. So they've started a couple of years ago. Exactly. Um, and, and also uh, uh, Mia Kiwi Pelter is actually using that in combination with a lifestyle intervention. Lifestyle, yes. I think that's the next stage is the combination of lifestyle and drug trials, like in diabetes. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, one question I think left, and it's a big one, and I might read it out. It's, the I think, one of the first questions we received. If a patient meets clinical criteria for amnestic MCI, MMSE, history imaging, um, and with biomarkers not available, amyloid um, or amyloid and amyloid PET, if an FDG PET is undertaken of the brain and that shows evidence of AD or logopenic AD, would you consider treatment based on the PET alone or concentrate on lifestyle changes, leaving pharmacological treatment to later? Um, question, I, I think both can provide a bit of input to that or... You can go first, Karen. <laughs> um, I think that's the million dollar question, isn't it? You know, exactly. We don't know, we don't know. Um, whether early treatment will actually prevent disease or not. We don't, I mean, that's what everyone wants. That's sort of the holy grail, I think, is to find something that you can use to prevent any symptoms. So yeah. I don't know if Sharon, you heard anything at Labor's conferences on it, or if yeah. anyone's doing trials. No, I mean, I only know for lecanemab, it was based on amyloid PET yes, and that yes. was MCI and MCI due to AD. Um, and so if we're thinking about lecanemab, then I guess we would want to still follow, you know, the very limited trial evidence we yeah. have, <laughs> which yeah. is the amyloid PET. Yeah, yeah. Ex exactly. For lecanemab, it has to be amyloid. And I think lecanemab will be coming to Australia. And so the PET amyloid will be the way to go. Or hopefully the blood markers may come into play in, in, in time. FTG PET may not be sufficient, is my taking. But they said if, if an FTG PET is undertaken that shows evidence, you know, would you consider treatment based on that alone? And I don't think that would be sufficient on its own. That's my take. So I'd like to thank our speakers, Ralph and Karen, always a very interesting talk. So we're really lucky to have you both international leaders presenting to the ADNET Memory Clinics Network today. So really grateful. I'm sure everyone's really enjoyed your presentations and such rich content in them as well. We've got another webinar, webinar coming up in May. So do watch this space. Um, and remember that if this webinar or any other webinars that you may have missed, they're all available on YouTube if you want to do some catch up or uh, bedtime viewing. <laughs> Um, lots there to catch up on, lots of content. This is a shameless plug, um, just to let you all know that in addition to AU Arrow that's been launched, we now have an online um, intervention for sleep. So for people with insomnia symptoms and MCI, the great thing about this is that people from all over Australia can participate. There is a website at the end. Um, if you have a participant with MCI and sleep um, complaints, then um, they can go on and do this um, six week intervention, which is run over 12 weeks. Um, so feel free to share this with your patients. Um, also, just to let you know, we do have the Australian Dementia Network Memory and Cognition Clinic guidelines out. We will be revising these um, very, very soon for um, culturally and linguistically diverse individuals who've done lots of work um, with stakeholders and focus groups, et cetera, as well as people with intellectual disability. So you'll see those very, very soon. And there'll be a revision of these as well, which will be briefer and very much linked in with the Clinical Quality Registry. Um, and lastly, if you're running a memory clinic service and would like to be listed um, or know anything about what we're doing, then feel free to email our team and uh, we'll certainly get in touch with you and, and discuss how we can help. 
Um, so that's it for our webinar today. We're just making it in at two minutes to five. So again, thank you very much for your time. Um, and we really look forward to seeing you in the next webinar in May. Thanks very much.